Right. A very, very good evening to you, wherever you are watching us from. You are right on time for this week's uh, discussion, right on Sports 360. And of course, you're hanging out with me, Martin Moses, alongside my co-host, Grace Muelo. And tonight, we are beyond pleased, we are beyond honoured to have with us top, top sports journalist, Manish Basin, the person we've grown accustomed to during the March Day Premier League events that you usually see on Super Sport here in Kenya. Welcome so much, Manish, and thanks for making time for us here today. Jumbo Martin, Grace. Yeah. Martin. Yeah. Thank you so much. Let's maybe just get right into it. But uh, first things first, how have you been in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic? I mean, how's the new normal of the social distancing, wearing masks, sanitizing? How are you guys faring on over there in the United Kingdom? Yeah, we're doing okay. It's taken a lot of getting used to it. Everybody is getting used to this new norm, aren't we? I mean, forever we're being advised at governmental level, we've got to keep washing our hands for 20 seconds. And the we take with us. Um, wherever we go, um, here in the UK, we're at the point now, the first lockdown has been eased, which took three months to get this whole thing under control. There are clearly reports around the world of second spikes. You know, now people in France have to come back and quarantine if they're on holiday there. It sounds like it's happening in Greece. Um, even in the studio, I don't know if you've actually noticed in Match Day Live, the last few weeks of the season when the Project Restart got underway. Um, we've got a new format to the studio where guests now have to be two metres apart um, and there's no standing. Um, it's sat down, so we're all in fixed positions uh, just for the health and safety of everything. We can't take any chances. Even in the studio, when you get into the building in London, um, masks have to be worn, canteens have shut down, even behind the scenes. You guys don't see this, I suppose, but for us, it's a very different way of living. Mm -hmm. So Manish, a little bird tells me you know a little bit of Swahili. Would you please yeah. tell us what is your background with Swahili and how much of Swahili do you know? Okay, well look, um, it's an interesting one. Um, so my father was born in Jinja. Um, so he was raised in Kampala. Um, he grew up on, and the thing is he's no longer with us. He very sadly passed away last year, but um, I carry a lot of that kind of influence with me uh, in all sorts of different ways. Like, um, so look, I know he was raised on something called Bukoto Street, which he talks of with very kind of rose tinted glasses. He had a fantastic childhood there. Uh, went to Kololo High School. And there might be some people around who might even know where Kololo School is. Um, what else? My grandfather was like a mm -hmm. chief accountant at what used to be the Apollo Hotel, which is now the Sheraton. Uh, uh, and that is in Kampala. And so, yeah, we've had this East African upbringing. So, you know, even in my everyday life uh, with my wife and my two children, when we talk about cooking, we talk about Machuzi, uh, the sauce. Uh, we talk about Basi, when we got to iron our shirt, <laughs> our clothes, um, Kitu as a knife, you know, all sorts of things. So, um, yeah, Swahili's kind of become ingrained as to, in fact, I grew up thinking, saying these words, thinking half of them were actually based in India or Indian origin. But mm -hmm. uh, afterwards, my father said, no, we're actually speaking an African language and it's called Swahili. And so everybody knows Hakuna Matata from The Lion King. I know Dambo, <laughs> Abariyaka, Missouri Sana. Um, and dare I say, Grace, mainly for you rather than Martin, Mimi <laughs> Napendewewe. <laughs> So would, would it be safe to say we can actually go on with this discussion in Swahili? Absolutely not. <laughs> we should just stick to English, yeah? <laughs> yes, please. You're doing a great favor. I don't want to be mistranslated. Okay, Wanish, when you were running the ad for the for this show, when you were running the promo, telling people that you'll be joining us here tonight, a lot of people are excited that you'll actually be on set here. But maybe for the few people who are watching right now, for the two or three people who don't know who Manish is, what will you tell them who Manish is and maybe in respect to sports journalism, why sports are not anything else? Who Manish is? Well, we've been asked that question before. Um, I am a 40-something-year-old, <coughs> uh, born in Leicester uh, in uh, 1976. Uh, I've got a twin brother. Um, I always wanted to play sport uh, professionally. Um, I was sports mad at school, at college, at university. 
uh, played cricket at a pretty decent level, um, football as well. Uh, but I always knew that if I couldn't play professional sport, I would love to cover it as a journalist. Uh, and at 14 years of age, which was pretty young, I got involved at my local radio station, learning the kind of very basic uh, skills of journalism, which was editing tape, uh, developing kind of scripts for uh, vocal purposes on radio. And I always knew from 14 that I'd love to be a football commentator or a football journalist or a radio presenter in sport. And so from 14, I went through all my colleges, all my degrees, A-levels, GCSEs, uh, knowing that that is the one job I wanted to do. Uh, and then at 21, when I was fully qualified, I got, I got a job at Radio Leicester and here I am. I went from, I'm your cliche, Martin, in many respects, because I went from local TV um, mm -hmm. to national TV to, uh, and then now worldwide TV. So I've been presenting now for 20 years and, you know, from radio to TV, it's, I've loved every second of it. Mm -hmm. Wow, that has been quite a journey, Manish. 20 years is no mean feat. What would you say has been one of your lowest moments or maybe the challenges that you've been through in your career? Um, challenges. Well, the thing is, everybody seems to tell you when you're younger that it's a very competitive field to go into. Um, I think we all, you know, we all look at TV and kind of like celebrities and think it's all very glamorous. People seem to think that there's only room for one person in that industry. I just think that, you know, after years of trying to prove yourself that you have what it takes, um, you have to convince a lot of people in the right places. You've got to um, stick at it. You will be given lots of rejections during the time uh, as you try and get to the point where you'd like to be. And, you know, even maybe now, I'm not, I'm not happy where I am right now. I think things can get better. Um, you, everybody has a burning fire inside them you know, to be ambitious, to be the best of the best at what they can be. Um, and I think a lot of people can, you either have that inside you or you don't. I think, you know, if, 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 if it's a challenge that you relish, don't let people say to you, oh, it's too competitive and this is not for you. So, look, listen, we all have knockbacks and we all have rejections, but it's how you respond that really matters. And, you know, now I think I, I'm, I'm very happy where things are going. And um, what I'd say to other people who want, who want to do the same is stick at it. If, if your heart is really, truly in it, uh, then don't tell you, don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Mm -hmm. Awesome stuff. Let's talk about your typical day because you see most of us, we just usually see you on March Day live on air. How does your typical day look like when you get into the office? What are some of the things that you usually do before going on air or even maybe other some, some studio work that you usually do by the side? Yeah. Uh, there's not a lot of work that goes in on the day itself. Martin, the work starts as soon as you finished your last program. I don't think you can afford to switch off. Um, when there's games being played, the key behind this game about presenting, about journalism, is preparation. That is the one word that I can't say enough times to anybody. There's no shortcut to success. There's no shortcut to being as good as you can be. Uh, you have to put in the hard work. Um, so if there's a game that night, as soon as I've finished in the studio, uh, I'll make sure that I watch that. It's a little bit challenging when, you know, the older you get, because children, you've got to factor into your life as well. You've got to offer your time to them because quality time with your children is, of course, very, very uh, important. Um, as, yeah, listen, as, as well as your other half. So, you know, I have a wife of 14 years. We all have quality time together as a family. But um, like I said, preparation is key. You watch games, you read papers, you read online, which I have to tell you, online preparation wasn't around when I was at university. I remember getting my first email address when I was at uni at 18. And that just goes to show how much things have changed uh, in the last 24 years. It's incredible. Um, and I know it sounds almost obvious, but for me to have lived a life where mobile phones were nowhere near around uh, for the first 20 years of my life, and then suddenly... Everyone's got mobile phones now, even my eight and 11 year old, 12 year old. Um, 
but watching games and reading uh, reading history about the game about any subject matter in this case of course for me it's football it goes on through the week when i come in on a saturday i can tell you i am fully armed with everything that i need to know about the teams involved the strategies they're going to play the formations the personnel who should play who should not play and why they're not playing in a way as a journalist i become so aware of things when i ask my guests the questions i almost know the answers and i want to be surprised and if they surprise me i take them down that route and i want to obviously search more answers behind what they're thinking so on the saturday to answer your question in the most ridiculously long-winded fashion martin all i can say is on the saturday i come in um, we have a nice casual chat with my uh, with my fellow pundits and they change week on week as you go um i want to know what they're feeling about the day ahead so it gives me an idea when we're in the studio just where to go with the conversation um but that really is just the the kind of the tweaks on the final day because basically in my head the show has all been made mm -hmm. Apart from football, and it looks like you sleep and work up football, what else do you do, Manish? What, what is that thing that you do on the side that we don't know about? Uh, I enjoy watching sports documentaries, but take away the sports element. I watch a lot of, I suppose, net, you know, a lot of the, the world right now, um, films, uh, Netflix uh, series. Uh, I like a good box set. Um, we went on a honeymoon, for example. When I got married, we went to the Maldives on the honeymoon and we were obsessed with 24. Do you remember that series? Um, we even took the box set of 24 with us. Uh, we, we were that obsessed. So um, uh, music is something that uh, I can give or take. And listen, I love music, um, but it's not something that, um, unlike some people, they feel that, you know, it kind of defines their life. Uh, that's, not, that's not me. I love. I like cooking. Uh, believe it or not, um, I can. You know, I can make the odd, uh, the odd, the odd dish from around the world. Um, what else? Playing. I suppose again. Listen, family time. Uh, like I've said it once or twice. Uh, if I'm not in the studio, I've, I've become a taxi service to the children, uh, and that's the way my life is going. <laughs> Ranish, let's come and talk about the societal and, and ills affecting the girls, They're still Leicester fans. They, Grace, I have made them Leicester fans. They have no option. Even my wife, when I married, when, when I first met her, she was a Manchester United fan. Now she knows the first result she has to look for is the Foxes. <laughs> we will be talking about Leicester in a few, but uh, first, let us talk about the societal ills affecting football, not necessarily football, but sports in general, things like racism. And allow me to say, around six years ago, you were on the receiving end of some racial abuse on Twitter. Is this something you like to comment on? And do you think we, as football stakeholders, the media, the clubs, the players, we are doing enough to combat this vice? Yeah, now that was interesting. Actually. So what happened six years ago, um, I was presenting regularly um, a show. In fact, for 12 years, I'd been on BBC One in the UK before I came to Premier League Productions to do Match Day Live. Um, so, you know, people know my face here in England um, for doing a show on Saturday afternoon or Football Focus. But then I did a Football League show show, which was essentially covering all the... Um, highlights from below the Premier League, the Championship League one and two. Now, somebody took an objection to something that I'd said on the programme and uh, used a couple of uh, racist terms to show that he wasn't particularly happy with me. Now, I was flabbergasted at the language that was used at the time. And what I did was I retweeted it to put it back out there and said, look, I will put up with a lot of things as somebody in the media spotlight. But one of the things I will not accept this day and age is abuse of this kind. Now, obviously, the wider Twitter sphere, my followers, uh, were equally shocked and saddened to see what this person had written. His football club, uh, and of course, they've got a profile name. 
And not only does it have his detail, which isn't clearly wise when you want to put something of that nature out there, um, the football club got involved, which was Middlesbrough, mm -hmm. and the police got involved and basically mm -hmm. um, warned this person. It turned out to be somebody who I think was only 14. And, you know, we've all heard the term keyboard warrior because everybody can, anybody can get involved on Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, they can pretend to be older than they are. They, they all seem to be a bit more braver because they can hide behind somebody else's photo. But this guy got found out. He got his uh, season ticket banned. And, you know, as far as I was concerned, I didn't want the police to get involved. But somebody else decided to report it to them. To the original question, racism is an issue. Yes, it's a societal issue around the world, wherever you go. Um, and it doesn't matter which country you're in. There always seems to be a subsection of society where they feel superior to others. Now, this is not on. Uh, we should never live in a divided society. We are all equal. We are all one, no matter what creed, color or race. Um, so the Premier League have taken it upon themselves um, post what happened in America. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement has clearly started to really gather momentum. And it is fantastic to see the players put their weight behind something like this. And we've all seen these incre incredibly powerful images of players taking the knee as soon as the kickoff whistle has been blown. It shows the wider world that we are not here to accept racism any longer in 2020. So I think we're going down the right route. I think we're sending the right messages. Um, I just hope that this becomes more than just a one-off campaign. Okay, Manish, time for a little banter. Your club, Leicester, first, first part of the season, a good part of the season, top three, and you didn't manage to finish even on the top four. How did that feel for you? And maybe what do you think Brenda should do in the next coming season? Well, thank you for reminding me, Grace. Um, you said it was banter. You've, you've, you've already made it difficult for me. Um, look, listen, what, what can I say? Leicester's Leicester. It's a, it's a small Premier League team. Um, what we did in 2016... <laughs> I still can't quite believe we did it. It was the most incredible achievement. And it's made other people sit, sit up and take notice that there is this team that over the years has been promoted to the Premier League, been relegated, been promoted, relegated, very much like a yo-yo club. Uh, and then we did, something, <laughs> we did something that nobody would imagine. So, yes, we had an amazing first half of the season. And... I still thought we wouldn't finish in the top four, even when we went into lockdown. I had this sneaky feeling that other teams might catch up because back then, Manchester United were just showing signs uh, of improvement with Bruno Fernandes and Pogba possibly coming together. And, you know, Chelsea is Chelsea. They've got good players. Um, they're a team that's been more successful than Leicester. And so I just thought, look, listen, if it, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. You know, it's quite strange. After what happened four years ago, for me, I almost feel resigned that I don't have the privilege or right to demand anything of my football club anymore. We reached the top of the mountain. So even if we fall short, I just think, you know what? That's life. It doesn't matter. And there might be people who might take glee and happiness in Leicester not doing it. But I can just turn around to them and say, yeah, but we won the Premier League. <laughs> <laughs> A true for so fun. Yeah, you know, it's, it's one so of those things. Uh, our national... Come again? No, I was just saying this is what happens. You know, you get you get the success, and it it of course outweigh, it out, outweighs all expectation. And when it happens, disappointment. You learn to put it in perspective. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, switching gears a little. Victor Wanyama is one of a, one of the players that is highly regarded in Kenya. He was the first Kenyan to play in the English Premier League. He's also our national team captain. You've had the privilege to cover him. What do you think? What do you make of his time at Tottenham? I think he was exceptional for Tottenham. I still think he's the kind of player that Tottenham have still struggled to replace, um, to find a rhythm, um, to have a player of his ability, uh, his standing, I think, as somebody who was not... He was often kind of portrayed as being the powerful player. But you know what? You've got to understand there has to be an element of skill as well that goes with Victor's game. Um, and I just think somebody like that, who is who was such an all-round asset to Tottenham, um, and, you know, people talk about him and the likes of Moussa Dembele in kind of similar, uh, kind of, um, in similar terms. I just think players like mm -hmm. that, are very much one off because we talk about people like John Obi Mikel, even you know, these guys. In fact, funnily enough, I think he's just uh, he's come back into English football. But these are plays that at the time you know are good, but when they leave, you realize how good they were and how valuable they were to the team ethic. I'm seeing a lot of comments on Facebook. We are live streaming this on Facebook, Manish. The likes of Cynthia, Bill, Peter. Thank you so much for streaming in. And Stephen Ocheng on Facebook wants to know who dresses you, Manish. Is it your wife or who dresses you? <laughs> oh, good question. You will love that. Um, uh -huh. Listen, this is quite funny, actually. Um, <laughs> we have... Um, we have a, um, a stylist who comes in um, into... Uh, Premier League productions now and again, just to give uh, people hints and advice. I get told by the stylist, you don't need any advice, which was actually very kind of quite complimentary. Um, yeah, I, you know, listen, I, I like to take care of, uh, of things of how I come across, how I look. Um, they've helped me with kind of maybe pushing me away from my zone because if it was for me, I'd normally wear predominantly blue, um, black and white, a little contrast outfit, but those, they've made me go down certain other colours. Um, but I do often sometimes send a Snapchat, a Snapchat of me uh, when I feel like I've been particularly adventurous to my wife, and, and she'll say, wow, actually, you surprised me. So, hey, look, listen, she's, she's got great taste, and if she says that, I take that as a compliment. <laughs> So I think Stephen Ochiek's question there is answered. Let's come to the fact, Manish, that uh, you have a background and heritage, heritage from the minority group, the group that we that are known, that is known as the BAME group. But you've defied all odds and become a top, top sports presenter. What will you say to a young person and a young journalist like myself, for example, and the others who are watching you at the moment? What does it take to reach such top levels? What advice will you give? Uh, do you know, it's strange because I never consider myself to be a member of the BAME community, and I'm not quite sure I like that acronym. It seems to be the fashion to use now. It kind of lumps all those of an ethnic minority together. Um, I think we all have our own different background. We're all, we all have um, um, a different tapestry to our lives. For me, I have a very interesting background. So my father, born in Africa, of Indian heritage, and a mother born in Burma, also of Indian heritage. So I, have, I feel like I'm slightly mixed and matched in some kind of way. But I myself, unlike both my parents, were born, you know, was born in England. And people will often say to me, wow, your English is amazing. Um, you know, if I close my eyes, I could never tell which kind of culture you have originated from. But then this is just the byproduct of the way the world is right now. Um, I came through the English educational system. I had, you know, English, I've got English friends. And, you know, if I was in America, I would have had an American accent. Um, this is the way of the world now. So, but I've, 
in my eye, I never go into this industry thinking, oh my goodness, there aren't many people like me in the industry. Um, I think we're becoming more conscious now of what the world is made of. People want to see something on their TV that's very reflective of, of the culturally diverse world that we all live in now. And so, you know, whether it's BBC, whether it's Matchday Live, it's, uh, we all, I think all the channels now have a very diverse kind of outlook of presenters. And if I had to give any advice, I'd say, look, listen, don't, don't feel that it's going to hold you back. In this day and age, I think it, it, could, it could work in your favor. Um, I just feel that, you know, right now, there is a, a, a new awareness about things. And in this country, my position of trying to prove myself, which I have to say, goes on day in, day out, is very different to maybe you, Martin, and you, Grace, working in Africa. Because, you know, you have historically, actually, what has been a very interesting place to live in, different colonies within Africa, um, different backgrounds, different mother tongues. Um, there might be a hierarchy that you might have to overcome. But those in big decision-making positions, once that starts to change, I think there will be a chance for everybody to make their mark. Nice. And Manish, something I would, I would actually want to know, you, you had the privilege of being president when Liverpool was, was being crowned champions this season. How was it? How would you paint the picture for someone who didn't get to cover that as a journalist? How, how did it feel for you? Well, first and foremost, it was a privilege um, to be at Anfield when there were only 300 people there. There might have been maybe three, 340, think about it now, because at the last minute, fam family members of the team were allowed to attend the trophy presentation. Ordinarily, there would have been 50,000 supporters there. There would have been thousands right across Liverpool, outside the stadium, ready to welcome the players. And to be there was an honour. Um, for a team that hadn't won the Premier League for 30 years, well, hadn't never won the Premier League, uh, and had, you know, had waited 30 years to win their first top flight league title. It was amazing. I mean, it was surreal in many respects as well, because I've been at trophy presentations, particularly when Leicester won it, when the, 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 there was a full house at the King Power. You know, they had, you may remember they had Andrea Bocelli singing opera with Claudio Ranieri before the game. There was a yes, magical sir. atmosphere. There were tears amongst the supporters. This could not have been further from the uh, scenes at Anfield, which I, I, I was at only a few weeks ago. And then when the pyrotechnics went off and you had the guy on the microphone saying Liverpool the champions, I mean, it was the most amazing firework display. Mm -hmm. There were no cheers. And it was, you could see the... You know, the, the players all kind of jostling with each other with the trophy. But for them, it must have been so strange and, and like I said, surreal. Um, but, you know, I suppose that if, if there was any one moment in this Premier League season that, that showed us these are strange times during COVID, it was that moment. Time for a little bit of analysis as we come to an end. We are almost wrapping it up. Let's talk about uh, the Champions League. Who are you backing? Because you see at the moment you have three semi-finalists who have never won the Champions League trophy and Bayern Munich, their opponent, are enjoying a, a terrific season. Who do you think will be carrying the season the Champions League? I think it's hard to look at um, Bayern I, I just think the way they played against Barcelona was simply exceptional. Uh, yes, Barca are bad right now, but eight goals is amazing. Um, Alfonso Davis, who I have to say, the more I see him, the more I just can't believe he's only 19. Um, to be on the same pitch as his boyhood hero, as Lionel Messi, he, he didn't care. Uh, for him, reputation means nothing. Um, 
you know, they've got Lewandowski, who's might be towards the latter stages of his career, but he just can't stop scoring goals. And Thomas Muller, who, to me, doesn't even look like a footballer at the best of time. You know, he looks quite gangly, quite tall, quite ungainly. Um, but even him, you know, he came away with a couple of goals himself. And then you add to the mix Philippe Coutinho, who's on loan from Barcelona. Um, I think I think Bayern are going to take some stopping. I think, um, you know, uh, there are some very good teams in the competition, clearly. Uh, but Bayern are my favourite right now. Uh, and I can see why. And what about the Europa League? The only English team that was remaining was eliminated yesterday, Manchester United. So it's up to Inter Milan, Shakhtar Donetsk or Sevilla. Who, what, what are your thoughts about the three remaining fixtures of the Europa League? So I think Shakhtar Donetsk, obviously the outsiders, but then you've got Inter Milan and Antonio Conte, um, who takes no prisoners. I think it's fair to say that guy is can be absolutely crazy on the sidelines. I think you've seen that already uh, when he was at Chelsea. Um, but the way Seville played, and their goalkeeper was quite incredible against United, Seville have done so well in the competition, haven't they? They've, um, they've, they seem to be perennial winners, um, especially under Unai Emery. But I think now, uh, for me, I think they're going to go on all the way. Um, to, to win the Europa League. I, I just think their pedigree in the competition is is unquestionable. Um, I think they've got some very good players and um, I think we saw that yesterday against United. Um, OK, United didn't take their chances, but when Seville are in the mood, mm -hmm. I don't think many can stop them. As you wind up, Manish, have you been to Kenya maybe? Uh, have I been in Kenya? No, I haven't. Um, actually, that's a really good question, Grace. Um, I was asked to go on a charity bike ride um, through Kenya, which would have happened in 2020, around uh, October, November time. Um, but because of work commitment, I couldn't do it. Now, this was all uh, in aid of uh, a local Kenyan charity which is being um, helped by a former Olympian runner uh, in, uh, by Team GB called Steve Cram. I don't know if you guys have heard of him. Um, he was a, a long-distance mm -hmm. uh, runner. Um, I think he got a couple of silver medals at the Olympics, but um, he's seen as one of the great Olympians mm -hmm. uh, that Team GB had kind of produced in the, in the 80s and 90s. And he's got a very, very um, strong affinity mm -hmm. to Kenya. Uh, and probably because, you know, uh, I think Great Britain and Kenya were always battling uh, for a place on the podium. Because, of course, Kenya has a rich heritage in terms of long distance running. Um, so I would have been here, I would have been there in Kenya in September, October time, but it, it just wasn't to be. Um, I've been to Cape Town more, probably more recently, but then that was back in 2010. Uh, for the football world cup um but i would love to cut i would love to go and in fact it was one of my one of my um aims was to go back with my dad um to see where he was brought up but obviously time in the end didn't turn up to be on our side karibu sana we look forward to hosting you here i'll let you guys know Okay, the very last question actually is on Facebook. We are done with our questions, but Lenas Mbogo on Facebook is asking, what are his thoughts on the upcoming season? Does he think Arsenal, I think this is an Arsenal fan, does he yeah. think Arsenal have any realistic chance of breaking into the top four? Um, a lot depends now on Mikel and what he does in the summer. Uh, I think top four might be pushing it somewhat. Uh, City, Liverpool, Chelsea, United, they're all going to get stronger. In fact, Chelsea clearly have already made um, two acquisitions in Timo Werner. Um, they've also brought in uh, Hakim Ziyech as well. And it looks like Kai Havertz might be on his way too. But yes, Arsenal have got in Willian, um, which I suppose is the biggest talking point from one London club to another. Uh, we've all already seen that the hierarchy at, Ch at Arsenal is changing. Um, 
Raul Sanlehi is gone. It looks like Mikel Arteta is now becoming all powerful um, in terms of not just managing the team, um, well, head coach, but also in terms of transfers, he's going to have a big say. So what I would say is with Arsenal, watch this space. If it's not going to happen this season, it could well happen the season after. Because Mikel, let's not forget, is still getting his feet under the table. Um, he needs to improve the defence. We've got a terrific front three. It sounds like Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang is going to uh, finally sign his new deal and that will be revealed in the next week, which is what I'm hearing. Um, so once the defence is sorted out, Willian on board, maybe two or three others, I think this season it could be outsiders for the top four. But the following season, who knows? Top four, maybe beyond, might be their main aim. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Nish, for making time for us today. We just can't overstate enough the fact that you actually made time to for us to have this discussion today. And maybe when your schedule allows, we are always welcome back here on Sports 360. Thank you, Martin. Uh, it's my pleasure to be part of um, Sports 360 with you and Grace. Um, thanks for having me. And uh, I wish you guys all the very best. Thank you. Thank you for everyone who watched. Thank you very much. See you some other time.